The Maya loom very large in our thinking and um, and are not as as frequent um, players in the book as originally. This is, you know, this we cover a lot of ground here and this isn't that thick a book. Um, but here's a little section on the Maya from this final chapter. In many regards, the problems we are facing now are ones we have faced before. Every culture in human history has engaged in both cooperation and competition and behaved both in ways that ought to make us proud to be human and in those that make us ashamed. Both glorious and ghastly actions have been widespread. When looking back on history, we have the responsibility to recognize that truth, and also to recognize when our ancestors' wins, legitimate or very often not, have provided us advantage that we did not ourselves earn. It is not, however, our responsibility to subjugate ourselves to those histories. Europeans indeed stole land from Native Americans and often grew some in despicable ways. The Native Americans who were thus subjugated themselves had a history of warfare and conquest in the New World, taking land from one another. And of course, none of this was new. They brought it with them to the New World when they crossed over from Beringia many thousands of years earlier. Let us not romanticize any people or period. Let us instead understand humanity holistically and work to provide opportunity equally to everyone going forward. In this book, we have shared an evolutionary toolkit with which to understand the human condition, not to justify it. We are not served by ignoring what we are, brutal apes by one measure. We are not served by, oh, we are also not served by pretending that brutal apes are the only thing that we are. We are also generous, cooperative beings full of love. We have arrived in the 21st century with evolutionary baggage and a fair bit of intellectual confusion. Let us understand the baggage in order to reduce the confusion and increase our odds of moving forward with maximal human flourishing. As an aid to this end, let us consider the Maya. The Maya thrived for over two and a half millennia in Mesoamerica, surviving droughts and enemies and other unpleasant extremes. In the now ancient city-states of the Maya, including not just Tikal, but also Ekbalam, Chachuben, and so many more, stone pyramids and temples are still visible above the tops of the trees. On the forest floor, footpaths run between ancient buildings, as do agoutis, lizards, and the occasional ocelot. More substantial roads, sakbes, connect city-states. Most of the Mayan city-states emerged as political, economic, and cultural forces to be reckoned with long before the Roman Empire existed. Wholly unaware of the other's existence, the Maya and the Romans were at their peak at the same time, in the early part of the first millennium, and both were in obvious decline by the beginning of the second. The Maya had an enlightenment of their own, long before the European enlightenment. We will never know its extent, <clears throat> we will never know its extent, as the vast majority of their books were destroyed by Europeans. The Mayan civilization was spread widely across the Yucatan Peninsula, extending south through modern Belize and Guatemala and just barely dipping into Honduras. The Maya were dominant in these landscapes for 2,500 years, but they were not monolithic and their successes waxed and waned over both time and space. City-states collapsed, droughts caused the abandonment of once fertile lands, and while some areas were repopulated by the Maya, others never were. The Maya were intensive agriculturalists who farmed on poor tropical soils, but managed to maintain soil fertility for a remarkably long time through successful land management. They dealt with the hilly slopes that were ubiquitous throughout much of their range with at least six types of terracing systems. They used complex reservoirs to conserve water during annual dry seasons and during less predictable, longer dry spells. It is also true, however, that where they cleared forests, the land was generally degraded and soil quality fell. By the time the Spaniards arrived, the Maya were already in decline. They had had a long run, and what exactly precipitated their collapse is up for debate. While the Mayan culture largely disappeared, the Mayan people persist. They were not a fragile people or culture. They were robust and long-standing, long-lasting. One indication of just how long a run they had is that they had a unit of time, the Bakhtun, equal to 144,000 days, almost 400 years. They were so long-lived as a people and so accustomed to thinking across long time spans that they used the Bakhtun to help keep track of time. The durability of the Maya suggests that the potential exists oops, that the potential exists for conscious, directed enlightenment in which we take ownership of our own evolutionary state. Like the Maya, we moderns need to find ways to flatten the boom-bust cycle that has plagued all populations across time. We hypothesize that the Maya did this by creating a mechanism for not turning excess resources into more people or ephemeral things. Instead, they invested in giant public works projects. Many of these public works projects are visible today as temples, as pyramids. 
They grew them like onions, building more layers in times of abundance. In years of plenty, we posit when excess food could easily have been turned into more people, which would have expanded the population, making hunger and conflict inevitable in lean years. The Maya instead turned the extra food into pyramids, or into bigger pyramids. They created glorious and useful public spaces, enjoyable by all, and when agricultural boom years inevitably ceded to bust years, the temples required no nourishment, and the population could withstand the leaner times. Western civilization has been dominant for nearly as long as the Maya were. Their culture unraveled, accelerated at the end by a hostile enemy from across an ocean. Our culture is unraveling as well. We need a new steady state, an evolutionarily stable strategy. We need to find the fourth frontier. And then we talk about obstacles. And I should say before, I know you have things to respond to in that, um, the obstacles that we talk about to the fourth frontier come from both the left and the right. And this is, a, you know, this is an explicitly apolitical book in which we identify ourselves as politically liberal, but liberals who can identify the types of errors that liberals, the people on the left side of the spectrum are more likely to make, and also identify the types of errors that people on the right side of the spectrum are more likely to make, and, um, and point out, as has been pointed out by many at other times, but many moderns seem to have forgotten that we need the tension, that we need people on both sides of a divide. Um, as long as we share basic fundamental values and a belief in each other's humanity, um, that disagreeing about exactly where we are and how to get to a better future um, makes for the possibility of progress, whereas tamping down all dissent does not. Yes. And in fact, I, I think it makes sense I still don't know how to make the point so people hear it, but um, we are liberals, but that is a a measure of where we believe we are in history. It's not a fundamental characteristic or a belief that um, progress is inherently good, right? It's a question of where we are and a recognition that we cannot possibly stay here. Just in an even simple extrapolation of how much resource we are using and how many of us there are and what that implies about the near term tells us this is not a, a, uh, an evolutionarily stable strategy that we are currently engaged in and therefore we have no choice but to change. But the, the point is, and as you point out, and this is something enlightened conservatives agree on, which is that the, it is the tension between the impulse to solve problems and a healthy fear of the unintended consequences of solution making that results in a society that functions and does not constantly upend itself with uh, naive errors. So, um, you know, are we at the place where we should all be progressives because progress is absolutely required? I think so. And maybe that's something you know, it will be interesting to see whether that message from the book lands, whether people see see that uh, necessity. But the those who would misunderstand you intentionally might hear uh, that any progress that is happening is therefore good, which of course is absurd. And um, and you know, we could we could. I think accurately argue that so much of the change that is happening now certainly does not look like what happened before and therefore could be semantically called progress, but is not actually uh, progressing us to anything like a better future. Yeah. It's like progressing through time isn't the same thing as progress in the way we mean it. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think narrative plays two roles that we haven't really separated yet. You and I both agree that the way you move people forward, the way history moves forward in the positive sense has to do with compelling narratives, not compelling analyses. Nobody pays attention uh, except for you know a small number of people to Orwell's uh, political philosophy, right? We pay attention to 1984 because it makes the point of that political philosophy in a way that's very visceral. So narrative and it, is this- And it's easier to confuse people with analysis and numbers and, and graphs um, precisely because it's not native for for many people, and you know I think um, many, especially you know like intellectual elites, media elites, and such, um, actually seem to agree with the widespread sentiment that just most people are dumb, most people can't take it, most people aren't interested, and so you just need to hand them pre-digested pap. We don't, we never have, um, and that was evident in our classrooms. Um, but what I do do believe and did see um, is that most people do not really think uh, quantitatively very well. Uh, they don't think with numbers very well. And I believe that having that as a, as a weakness 
um, is is runs hand in hand with therefore being more easily uh, confused and lied to with those sorts of tools. Right. People, I think they, you know, if you're talking to an honest broker who knows what they're talking about and they present an analysis where you can't quite follow the math, but you can, you understand what the conclusion of it is. You're not in no danger, but you're in less danger. But the problem is when you have no idea who it is who's constructed the analysis. I mean, this is this was the point of how to lie with statistics, which is right. for people who aren't in a position to check the underlying logic, statistics are a place that you can bury a lot of bodies. Um, so anyway, yeah. narrative on the one hand is the way you would move things forward positively. But we also live in a landscape where everything is basically subject to official narratives that do not appear to have our interests at heart. And so, mm -hmm. you know, surrendering to the idea that narrative is perhaps the most important thing, but that it is also a landscape that is uh, ripe for abuse is maybe part of the the tension of, of our of our moment. Mm -hmm. um, did you have more to say there? Well, I did. It did occur to me as you were reading that section of the book that maybe one way um, to move at least one of our attentions forward is to write uh, a sequel oh boy. called something like um, uh, The Caterpillar Who Was Unknowingly at Fault for His Own Hunger, that that book might actually bridge the divide between these two narratives and we might be able to move forward from there. Mm pick up some of the, uh, uh, what's it, I even forgot what the caterpillar book is called. Um, the very hungry caterpillar, like br picking up some of that audience. Well, I, I just don't think that this caterpillar is entitled to be freed from all responsibility for his predicament. You think his insatiability is his own doing? In one way or another, I feel certain of that, yes. Mm -hmm. I and actually do not remember the plot of the book, so I can't really know that that's... I mean, the plot is just that he eats everything, but I don't remember the conclusion. All right. Yeah, I have yeah. the feeling. I think I, it, it was. It's kind of thin on plot, which is, um, you know, true for a certain style of children's books. It's thin on plot. I okay, think. I'm. I'm pretty sure it's going to end with him turning. I mean, I'd prefer it if it was a moth, right? Um, Why? Because it's more surprising. But I have the sense that that the caterpillar probably turns into a, a beautiful diurnal butterfly and uh, lives happily ever after for the next two weeks <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> yes, it's true. I mean, actually, I don't know. Um, this is definitely the moment to get into what we do and do not know about Lepidoptera in biology, right? You and me or science? No, knows. no. Us. Oh, we, um, yes. I, so mm -hmm. I don't know if... Um, if actually it's, if, if any adult um, butterflies or moths, lepidopterans, um, live a long time, or even if, um, if they will tend to live as long as they spent as, as larva, the larval form is often longer. Yeah, than the it, adult it, form. it varies a lot because yeah. the larval form has so much resource accumulation to make. I think certain things like sphingid moths mm -hmm. are actually fairly long lived. You know, we know a guy. We will ask our expert friend and. Absolutely. Actually, yeah. we should we should do a thing on sphingid moths. Sphingids yeah. are really sphingids are sphinx moths. Um, they're gorgeous. Yeah, they're beautiful. Sometimes mistaken for hummingbirds because of their flight agility. Um, are you serious? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, mistaken yeah. for hummingbirds. Sure, I think I may even have done it once or twice. You know, okay. something flies by. But uh, anyway, they're uh, nocturnal, so it's not yeah. so easy to confuse them. But there are moments in the day when it can happen. Yeah. And there is actually, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, some, a, a section in the book in which we ask um, if a butterfly remembers being a caterpillar. Um, and the answer is presumably not, and there wouldn't be much value. value in that. Presumably not, because there would be so little value. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe just these last three paragraphs sure. of the final chapter before the epilogue, before the afterword, before the acknowledgements, glossary, et cetera, et cetera. From the moment when our ancestors achieved ecological dominance, competition between populations has been our dominant selective force. Millions of years of evolution have refined our circuitry for such competition, and it has become the default at the human software level. Now, though, three things conspire to make the inclinations that brought us to this moment an existential threat to our future. The scale of the human population, the unprecedented power of the tools at our disposal, and the interconnectedness of the systems on which we depend, global economy, ecology, and reach of technology.
The importance of understanding human software is urgent. The problem we face is the product of evolutionary dynamics. All plausible solutions involve awareness of those dynamics. The problem is evolutionary. So is the solution. <laughs>